today it is a body working for the betterment of society in general and students in particular under the patronage of UNESCO. With fierce competition among students from across India and abroad, display of cutting-edge technology, motivational speeches to inspire the youth and workshops to sharpen their skills, TechFest today is a wholesome platform that students across India can look up to. With various social initiatives and campaigns like Green Campus Challenge and Give a Coin, TechFest aims at grouping together the power of youth towards a better and a sustainable India. We are pleased to have with us today a renowned astronomer, Charles H. Lineweaver. Dr. Lineweaver is a senior fellow of the Australian National University's Planetary Science Institute. He holds an appointment as he holds a joint appointment as an associate professor in the Research School of Astronomy and Astrophysics and the Research School of Earth Sciences. He obtained an undergraduate degree in physics from Ludwig Maximilians University, Munich, Germany and a PhD in astrophysics from the University of California at Berkeley. He was a member of the COVE satellite team led by George Spoon, the physics prize winner in the year 2006, that discovered the temperature fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background. Before his appointment at ANU, he held postdoctoral positions at Strabourne University Observatory and the University of New South Wales where he taught one of his most general study courses, Are We Alone? His research areas include cosmology, determination of the age and composition of the universe, exoplanetology, the statistical analysis of exoplanets, and astrobiology, using our new knowledge of cosmology to constrain life in the universe. His research has been published in Science, Nature, the Astrophysical Journal, Astrobiology, Scientific American, American Journal of Physics, and the Microbiology Australia. Based on his knowledge, enthusiasm and experience, we are immensely grateful that he is here today to speak to us about Are We Alone? Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Charles H. Lineweaver. I request one of my colleagues to please present sir with a bouquet. Everyone, hear me. Yeah. Okay. All right, so this is working. Yes. So, are we alone? This is me. Oh, get my laser pointer out. Uh, I'd like to, uh, if possible, I'd like to try an experiment. When you have questions, or you, if I say something that you disagree with, raise your hand and say, "Hey, what about this?" But if that's going to work, you're, you're going to have to speak very loudly because we're so densely packed in here to get a microphone is is not very uh, is not very good. So, if you have any questions, raise your hand and I'll say, okay, what's your question? What's your objection? So, let's try that. Okay? Yes. <laughs> All right. All right. So, uh, for about uh, three years, I ran a colloquium program at Mount Stromlo Observatory. And every time we had a speaker, I would ask them, are we alone? And I took a survey. So, 90% of professional astronomers think that there is life elsewhere in the universe. And I asked them why, and most of the time they said, because the universe is so big, it's spatially infinite, or it's very close to being spatially infinite. And so what that means in particular is that there are about 10 to the 11 stars per galaxy. By the way, this is a, a field, a Hubble Space Deep field, and uh, each one of these dots is a galaxy. So there are about 10 to the 11 stars per galaxy. 10 to the 11 galaxies in the observable universe, and since you are all technology students, you know that that means that there are 20, 10 to the 22 stars in the observable universe. And if you want to know what the observable universe is, think of yourself on a boat in the Bay of Bengal, and you're looking around, you can't see any land, that is your observable universe, that's your horizon, and we are in much the same position in the universe. We look around us, and our observable universe is a sphere of distance 3CT, where C is the speed of light, T is the time since the Big Bang, 13.7 billion years, and there's a three there because the universe has been expanding. Anyway, that's the size of the observable universe. And also, terrestrial planet formation is almost certainly a common result of star formation. In a previous talk I gave last year, I had, is probably a common result of star formation, and because of recent data, I changed that to it almost certainly. I'll show you some of that data in the talk. Any questions so far? 
No. No? Okay. Are we alone? Now, I wanted to, I, of, I often give us, have a survey. I taught this course for a while, and at the beginning of the course, I would take a survey, and I would ask the students, are we alone? So, uh, yes, no, or maybe. Let's do a survey here. Who says, we are alone? Yes, we are alone. Raise your hand. Okay, about 10 people. Okay, no, we are not alone. The vast majority. And how about a maybe? Okay, maybes are more prominent than the, the no. Yes. All right, so that, by the way, seems to be an international result. I've given this talk uh, around the world, and most people say no, but you, matter of fact, there's a little bit more of a, a no bias here in India. I'm not sure why. <laughs> I, I will be trying to convince you that the proper answer is, huh. <laughs> So it also depends that this question, like many questions, it depends on what you mean by the words in the question. So the, now we're going to talk about what we means. Now, some people, when they ask the question, are we alone, they mean we homo sapiens. And some people say, oh, we, we, the life forms of Earth. And uh, well, so the answer does depend on what you mean by we. So if you have a narrow definition of we, and you say, well, the we means functionally equivalent homo sapiens, or life forms with human-like intelligence. I should say that one of my mentors, one of the reasons I'm standing before you as a cosmologist, is because of Carl Sagan. I read a lot of Carl Sagan's books. I love this guy. But I disagreed with him completely about this point. He thought that there were functionally equivalent human beings, or homo sapiens, all over the world because there were many ways to get that. And I will argue that that's wrong. Uh, but anyway, so if you have a narrow definition, the answer is yes, we are alone. For the same reason that, uh, let's take Hindi as a language. How reasonable would it be to go looking for Hindi-speaking extraterrestrials? Or so, or so, yeah, we laugh because any human language we know is a quirky product. And unfortunately, or fortunately, your DNA is also a quirky product. And English is a quirky language. Any language is a quirky. But then we have to ask, is us, are we as a species, as quirky or less quirky than Hindi or English or any other language? And so we need a quirkometer in order to answer this question. And it's, it's not easy to have one. I've never heard of that being developed by a reasonable scientist. OK, how about no? Now, if we have a broad definition of we, and I'll introduce you to what this might mean, but for example, if you've considered that far from equilibrium dissipative systems are life forms, then stars are life forms, then hurricanes, and convection cells, fires, maybe Gaia, the whole biosphere, and viruses, and including humans, are alive. And if that's the case, then we already know the answer. No, we're not alone because we see these things all over the universe. We have already detected the life forms. We just haven't recognized them as life forms. So if you have a very, very broad definition, and I think this is not ridiculous, as a, it's a very good physics-based definition, then no, we are not alone, and we, don't know, and we already know the answer to the question. Now, a more traditional or an average-sized definition of we, if we have an average-sized definition of we, then you're talking about adaptive complex systems with some form of inheritance such as RNA, DNA, viruses, microbes, and eukaryotes, whether they exist elsewhere in the universe is more difficult to decide. So if we have a narrow definition, yes, we already know we're alone. A broad definition, no, we already know we're not alone. And if you have this average size definition, then, well, we're not sure. Does everybody agree with that? Yes. yes. We do. Anybody disagree? Gosh, you like to agree here. Okay. <laughs> All right. So about, about 12 years ago, this show was popular. Do you know this show, by the way? Anybody know? Okay. Anyway, it's X-Files. And uh, the students at the University of New South Wales were very, they loved this show. And the university wanted us, we professors, to think of courses that would get the students to enroll in these courses. So we, we yeah. A couple of uh, other, well, one other professor in astronomy got together and said, why don't we make a course called Are We Alone? We know much more about what's out there than the Hollywood producers of this show. 
So why don't we know? We know. We know the truth that's out there, not these guys. So let's make the show. So let's make the, the course. Are we alone? And so that's what we did. That's how I got started into this sorted business of are we alone. Now, the first, the first time we had this course, I was trying to prepare lectures for the course. And every year, they have an orientation at the University of New South Wales. And I was walking around campus saying, oh gosh, what am I going to say? I'm a legitimate scientist. I can't talk about aliens in outer space. And then I saw this. I saw the University of New South Wales Spock Society, Spock Soccer, promoting Star Trek and other science fiction TV shows. And I said, do you guys know anything about extraterrestrials? They said, do we ever? We know all kinds of things about it. And so he told me about all the people who lived on this planet and that planet and this planet and that planet. And they went on and on and on. And, and, at the, and I, I guess I'm not a big science fiction fan, but I, my ignorance was showing. And at the end of this half hour, 45 minute discussion with the Spock Sock members, they said, how can you teach a course on extraterrestrials? You don't know anything. <laughs> And I said, wait, you know, I, I'm a little bit of an egoist or something. I said, I do know something about extraterrestrials. I know something, like, I'm an astronomer, a trained astronomer, so I know what's out there. Uh, and my dad was a high school biology teacher. He had the skeletons in the closet, literally. So <laughs> I, I knew something about biology. And so, for example, one of the things I think I know, and this is something as a cosmologist you get to do, you get to put the entire history of the universe on one slide. So you start out here at the Big Bang, about 13.7 billion years ago, where you produce light elements like hydrogen, helium, helium-3, helium-4, a little bit of lithium, 6 and 7. And then you have these over-densities. These bumps are called over-densities. They're over-densities and under-densities, kind of like the sound waves coming from my voice. And then they collapse into stars, the big stars that are blue. They go boom and create all these black lines. These are elements coming out of the big stars. And then the red stars, notice that they don't go boom, they last or the age of the universe or longer. And then F with these heavier elements, not just the hydrogen and helium, but now with carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, you form a next generation of stars. And the debris of these other elements around the stars in the accretion disks of these stars produces planets. And we have a very deterministic theory there that shows how you get from here to there. Now, here's biology. So, so I, guess, well, I guess the point here is that astronomy through some process of cosmic evolution has led to biology. And you and I are biological creatures, and we would like to know who we are, how we got here. And, well, we talk to biologists, and they have these trees, these phylogenetic trees, and they can tell you, for example, that here are animals, and here are fungi, and here are plants, and then your chloroplasts came from cyanobacteria, et cetera, and there might have chondria that came over here that turned us into eukaryotes. And in any case, the whole process there is, is pretty well understood, except what's missing is an understanding of the origin of life. And that's important if you want to analyze or if you want to answer the question, are we alone? Because you need to know how probable is it that the conditions on Earth that led to the formation of life and then this diversification, how probable are those conditions elsewhere? Do you need a magic ingredient? Or are the other planets around these other stars similar enough to Earth to have already produced life? So that's a, that's a question. So it's a kind of interesting to talk about deterministic physics and then quirky biology. One analogy for tech-savvy um, people is that the quirkiness here is a little like when you take a microphone and put it near the speaker. It amplifies the noise, and then we have a self-referential self system that turns into quirky amplified noise here. And here we have deterministic physics that we all have nice equations for. Uh, that's why equations don't work very well up here. So here's, a, here's an interesting picture. Another way to understand cosmic evolution is that four and a half billion years ago, a molecular cloud turned into this. <laughs> Now this is not only true, it's not only funny, it's true. And let me show you, I can turn into a movie, watch this. <laughs> so this is a really a discretization of a longer movie that's more complicated. But in any case, four and a half billion years, a cold, odorless gas turned into a kangaroo. I should point out that life forms are made out of hock and piss. H-O-C-N-P-S. Those are those five, six elements. And you 
are made out of that. The bacteria in your mouth is made out of that. The trees outside are made out of that. The dogs, the cows, the, uh, the uh, fungi, and the bacteria are all made out of this in relative proportions that are remarkably similar to each other. Here is an atomic number, and here are the different elements, and here's a logarithm of the relative abundances in the universe. Now this is really the sun, but the sun happens to be a fairly representative in terms of the relative abundances of elements in the universe. So the universe is made out of hydrogen and helium, and it's a logarithmic plot, so you can see how they dominate. And that's why astronomers say there are three things in the universe, hydrogen, helium, and then everything else, metals. We call all these metals. Now, on the other hand, if you look carefully and ignore the noble gases, get rid of helium and get rid of argon, wherever that is, where's argon? Right there. And neon, then what's left are the elements that you and I are made of. In other words, whatever process is responsible for having created life, it used the flour and the sugar, the most abundant elements that were in the kitchen. That's one fact about life. We are not made out of these things. Neodymium, gadimium, samarium, dysoprosium, uranium, these things, they're too low abundance. You can't make these are the spices, and, and you have to start out with, I guess, the sugar and the flour or something. Uh, so, you might imagine that it's no accident that we're made out of these elements, and therefore, if life elsewhere is also a chemical thing, it too would be made out of these elements. So, one guess would be that uh, other life forms, if they exist, would also be made out of the same elements. I'm often asked, well, what about silicon? Uh, silicon is kind of abundant here, and we don't use it much in there. But instead of carbon, but look at this. This is the logarithmic plot. Here's 10 to the 4. Here's 10 to the 5 for carbon. So carbon is about 12 times more abundant in the universe than silicon is. So if you have life forms that are based on silicon, and life forms are based on carbon, let's say that it's equal probability, then there would be 12 life forms in the universe based on carbon, and only one based on silicon. On the other hand, you could also say that silicon life forms, silicon does not, not as, it's not as interesting, and it makes sand and rock rather than interesting organic molecules. Any questions? Yes? Loudly, please. Why is the graph so rough? Why is the graph so rough? Well, one thing about the, first of all, these things are made in the Big Bang. These things are made, they, they require energy. Anything above iron, see iron? Iron, to go from here to here, you can use fusion energy. To go here, you have to put in energy. It's like an endothermic reaction, and that happens when supernovae go boom, put in lots of energy, and but you still not enough to make it very abundant here. The reason it goes up and down, up and down, are because if you study a little bit of nuclear physics, you'll know that there are magic numbers where even are more favored than odd, and that's, that's why it goes up and down, up and down, up and down. But uh, that's the best explanation I can give in 10 seconds. <laughs> okay. Now, the building blocks of life can be made in the lab. In 1953, 1954, there's something called the Uri Miller experiment. And what Uri Miller did was heated it up some stuff. They put in some gas, water gas, methane, ammonia, and hydrogen. Had some electricity going on here. And then they cooled it down, and they just went around and around in a circle. So they're electrocuting, putting lightning into these gases. And then at the end of the day, they found here amino acids. And there was a... The, the main title of the New York Times was Scientists Make Life in the Laboratory. <laughs> what they made was the building blocks of life. And that's uh, something that's important. But now we know that the building blocks of life fall from the sky. If you go like this, or what you're, you're using your brain right now to think, your brain is made out of amino acids, those are proteins, these are made out of amino acid, amino acid, amino acid, some polymer. And those polymers are in, well, the amino acid, the building blocks of those proteins are in this Murchison meteorite, which is a carbonaceous chondrite, which fell in Murchison, Australia, 1969. So I imagine, I think this is not crazy, that any time you're forming a rocky planet, the same processes that led to the amino acids in this rock are everywhere in the universe, not just in our solar system, but in others as well. In other words, there's nothing particular about the chemistry of our proto-solar nebula that led to the formation of the amino acids here. So it might be a good guess, based on this, that other life forms also would be based on amino acids. Those would be the monomers of the polymers, which we call proteins. Uh, also an interesting fact seems to be that life formed as soon as it could have. 
So here's the present, here's a billion years, two billion years ago, three billion years ago, four billion years ago. This is the relative amount of surface area and when it was formed. And you can see that the surface area of the Earth is very young. Venus is very young, but the surface area of Mars, the Moon, and Mercury are very old. And you can measure that, you can see that easily by just seeing how many craters are on the surfaces of these bodies. And life on Earth formed about four billion years ago. So almost as soon as the planet did. So if here's the today, here's where the Earth formed, life formed right here. And life has been on this planet for that long. So often you can, see, you can argue that, well, if something happens quickly, that means it's probable. So that's an indirect argument. There's a very sophisticated version of that we wrote in a paper in Astrobiology. You can have a look at it. But uh, anyway, this is an awesome fun thing. This is something you can repeat with a lot of caveats. So one big picture that I'd like to leave you with, or start you with, is that the, the terrestrial environments known to harbor life, there's something called astrobiology. Astrobiologists go around into caves where it's very cold, or there's no light, or they look at streams where the pH is very acidic, three, or two, or one even, or sometimes it's very basic, a pH of 11, 12. And uh, they have found organisms there. They're called extremophiles. Sometimes they're very high pressure. Sometimes they're very low temperature. Sometimes a high temperature. In other words, life has adapted to or came from regions that are very, very unlike the 23 degrees you have right here in this room. We are called mesophiles because we like temperatures like that, but some bacteria like at 90 degrees Celsius. Some even can survive at 122. That's the world record now. And they can survive there. You might, you might notice, if you're clever, that 122 is greater than 100. 100 is when water boils. But at the bottom of the ocean, water doesn't boil at 100 or even 122. So it's higher because you have a lot of pressure. So there is liquid water at 122 degrees in hydrothermal vents in the depths of the ocean where there are life forms surviving in those temperatures. So the, the ranges of temperatures and pH and pressure uh, are very large. And so in other words, this blue circle is getting bigger. The terrestrial environments known to harbor life are getting bigger as we explore life on this planet. Now, the other thing is that extraterrestrial environments known to exist are also getting bigger. We're discovering more and more and more planets every day. 1995, we found the first extraterrestrial, well, a, a planet around another star, another sun-like star. And since then, there are arguably about 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 planets now known. So in the last 15 years or so, we've made a lot of progress, and this will continue in the next decade. Now, one thing I wanted to talk to you about is just show you a little bit of data about why we think most stars have planets. Now, in 1995, when we discovered the first planet around an extra, another sun, then we didn't know what the lower limits on the percentage of stars with planets. How many stars have planets? Is our system somehow unique? Or do every single star out there, does every single star have a planetary system around it? We didn't know the answer to that question. We still don't know it fully, but you can see that this plot is going up and up and up and up. And this is real data from just this year. And so I predict that this will just go to 100%, and we'll just have 100% of stars out there with some type of planets. Well, then we have to ask another question. Are they going to be Earth-like planets? Are they going to be rocky planets? Or are they just going to be like Jupiter, Saturn, gaseous ones? Anyway, I just wanted to show you that the data says that almost all, a large fraction, if not all stars, have planets around them. Anybody have a question on this data set? No? No? Okay, here's another data set I wanted to show you, and that is here's the period of a planet. The period of the Earth, for example, is right there. And here's the mass of the planet in units of Jupiter's mass. And so here's our solar system. We have Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. That's our planetary system. Here on these, these dots, each one of them is a planet that has been found around other stars with different techniques. The large, the, the big scatter here, the big red blobs, the big blobs, of, uh, a big cloud of red points, is from the Kepler. These are uh, transit uh, measurements from Kepler. This is an instrument that stares at a bunch of stars, 200,000 stars, it just stares and stares and stares and stares. And every time there's a planet that passes in front of the star, the light goes down a little bit, and then it goes up again. And so they do that 
year after year, they've been doing it for three or four years now, and when they see something doing regularly, then they put a planet on here. And so over the next two years, this red blob, will, this red cloud will be moving over into this region, which is more like the Earth, and then we will detect more and more Earth-like planets, unless, of course, they don't exist, in which case we won't. But there's every indication by doing an analysis of this that when you plot out how the numbers are going versus the sensitivity of the instrument, there's every indication that these numbers will be going up with time. And that's been going on for the past 10 years. Notice that there are different ways to, here's the uh, imaging. There's imaging when you look at the, you block out the star and then you look at the planet nearby and these are the imaged planets. So we're directly looking at the light coming from these planets here. And then there's ways to do it with microlensing, for example, using general relativity and the, and the bending of light around the stars. Anyway, it's a complicated plot. I just wanted to show you that we're making lots of progress. And with time, this blob, these blobs will move over here. The only reason they haven't moved over here yet is because we haven't looked long enough. We've only been looking for 10, 15 years. And so if we look for 100 years or 1,000 years, this whole thing will be plotted up to, remember, it's a logarithmic plot, so 1,000 years is somewhere here. So we'd be full up to here, but then we wouldn't see these guys. But we would be able to detect it with direct, the direct detections are not limited to that. Any questions on this? Yes? Does it include I'm sorry, you have to speak up louder? Uh, can someone repeat the question loudly? I couldn't, I didn't understand. Uh, this data, does, does it include subplanetary objects like rock planets? Oh, does it include subplanetary objects like what? Rock, 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 rocky planets. Well, rocky planets are down here. Rock, 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 could live on the rocky uh, planets, uh, rocky moons of the planet. Uh, yes? So how do you detect the mass of the planet? How do you detect the mass of the planet? Well, it depends on which technique you're using. For example, the radial velocity technique, these, these blue dots, that the radial velocity technique works in the following way. You have a star, and you have a planet going around it. Right? Now, if your planet goes around the star, the star will go like this because they're both going around the barycenter, their mutual barycenter. You can't see this thing, so what you see is this. But you don't see it going around and around, you see it going forward and backward. That's the radial component of its motion that you can detect. And the more it goes, the more massive the star that you cannot see. 
So that's one way to detect the mass. Uh, each each uh, technique has a slightly different way to detect the mass. For example, the transit technique, these red dots, well, how do you detect? Well, it's the size of the object that's passing in front of the star. So if the star's luminosity goes boom, way down, then it's a big object. If it just goes down a little bit, then it's a small object. Then you convert that size into a mass using some estimates, assumptions about the density of the object. Yes? Is water necessary for the habitable zone? Is water necessary for the habitable zone? Well, it's just the definition of the habitable zone. Whether there are going to be life in the habitable zone, we don't know, but it just says, hey, that's where you have the temperature on the surface that might be between 0 and 100 Celsius. So it's just a convenient way. Don't, don't, it doesn't mean there's going to be apes there. <laughs> it doesn't mean there's going to be life here. It just means that if you're interested just in the deterministic physics, that's a good place to look for liquid water. It should be called the liquid water zone. Any other questions? Okay, moving on then. Yes, oh, here's a question. Uh, so what if two identical bodies turn out uh, between the star and that would be a wrong prediction, right? If two identical bodies turned out, what, what does that mean? Uh, it's like if, uh, both, if there are planets yes. with the same mass. Yes. Uh, so what about it? Well, if, if, here's the, if here's the host star, here's another planet, here's another planet, let's say they both have the same mass, yes. well then they'd have different periods. Okay. And it's just, like, uh, it's just like here. Here's Venus and Earth, they about have the same mass, but one's further away, and so you can tell it's the difference because it's, uh, it's a different period. Right, it's a sine wave, one's a sine wave like this, and the other's a sine wave like that. Yes? How do you determine the distance to the star? Well, the first approximation, uh, or zeroth approximation, all stars have the same luminosity, and the brighter ones are the ones that are closer. That's 100 years ago, we found out that all stars are not the same luminosity, so therefore we had to figure out some, we used spectroscopy to see what the intrinsic luminosity of stars were. So big blue stars are very luminous, and small red stars are not. And so you look at the spectrum, figure out whether it's blue or red, and then you do the same thing. So, that's it. <laughs> yes? What over here, over here? Uh, how massive they are. Massive stars are very, they're burning, uh, massive stars are burning a lot of hydrogen, and they're gigantic. They're, for example, they're three or four times the mass of the sun, and they're much, much hotter. And you can see how hot they are by looking, comparing your spectral results to the spectrum of a black body, for example. And if you look at a, or if you look at a, well, you know this from seeing in an oven, for example. When an oven is red hot, it's kind of hot, but if it's blue hot, it's even hotter. If you look at the flame from a match, the hottest part is the, the bluest part, the cooler part is the yellow and then the orange, right? Same thing works for stars, except we're talking about what is it, about a thousand times, no, a hundred times higher, hotter. Yes? Can you speak up, please? Yes, some stars are older, that's right. As stars get older, they get more... Well, being closer to us or further away does not change the color of the star. Except if you're so far away that you're receding, as in the universe is expanding. That's a whole other issue. We're talking here about stars in our galaxy. Anyway, let me move on here. Okay, so, now, I have a car, and my car has a position in an age distribution. So here's the car production, millions of cars per year, and let's imagine that it's something like this. Now my car is here, newer cars are here, and the newest cars are the most abundant ones. So that's, so my position, so there are this many older cars, and this many newer cars, so there are only maybe 10% or 15% of the cars on the road are older than my car. Now replace car with Earth and the sun. So here are, here's the distribution of stars, and then here's the distribution of planets. And I'll show you the data for this. But the point is that here's where our sun and Earth form, and here are all the younger Earths, and here are all the older Earths. And it looks like our 
Earth is a very, very young Earth compared to the older ones. So something like three quarters of the Earths in the universe are older than ours. Now that's kind of scary if, uh, if you think that every Earth produces technological civilizations which then take over the universe because, well, first of all, it doesn't seem to have been the case, but if we, that means if we contact these civilizations, or they contact us, they will, on average, be two billion years, have two billion years more time to have evolved. Now, two billion years is not a short amount of time. And uh, that's important. <laughs> so here's the data. Uh, so we start out by making this plot. This, is, by the way, is from this article in 2001. This is a tripartite plot on the x-axis is the Big Bang to now. So 13.7 billion years. So here's where the universe started. Here's where we are now. If you talk about the star formation rate, it looks like this. There wasn't any star formation in the very beginning. It zoomed up, and then it's been coming down since, the big, since about this epoch here. So if, now, to make a planet around these stars, you can't just have hydrogen and helium. You need carbon and oxygen and silicon and oxygen. Well, that's what this rock is made of. We're standing on a rock. It's not made out of hydrogen and helium. It's made out of silicon and oxygen and iron and magnesium. All of these elements had to have been produced in previous generations of massive stars. So the first stars did not have those elements, and therefore the first stars to form could not make rocky planets. And that's why, <coughs> excuse me, that's why uh, there's a difference between the star formation rate and the terrestrial planet distribution. So here's the metallicity of the universe. You, know, you might know that if you don't put out your garbage, your kitchen fills up with garbage. Right? The same thing is happening in the universe, but instead of garbage, there are heavy elements being produced. The stars are producing heavy elements all the time, and there's no one to take out the garbage, and so the metallicity of the universe just goes up and up and up and up and up. You need a certain amount of metallicity to produce these, star, these rocky planets, and so you need about this much here, somewhere. Somewhere here, just, uh, you need to get up to about right here or here or here. Right there. You can't produce rocky planets with this amount of metallicity. It's a logarithmic plot. So you have to wait around in the universe in order for the universe to have enough metals to make terrestrial planets. So when you put that plot together with this plot, you get this distribution. So here's where the Earth formed and the Sun. All of these are the planets that are older than our Earth. All of these are the younger ones. And you can see here that there's a difference that the most of the planets, the terrestrial planets in the universe, are going to be older than ours. There's been plenty of time for life to have evolved elsewhere because the mean of this distribution is 1.8 plus or minus 1 big years older than the Earth. So that's the mean over here. So uh, if life is common in the universe, as suggested by the rapid appearance of life on Earth, then this age distribution gives us an idea of how we compare to other life that may exist in the universe. That's in this article here. Now, when we published this article, new scientists covered it. And they said, oh, the Earth is a terrestrial pot. Our home planet may prove to be wet behind the ears. Remember when you're a baby, you're uh, wet behind your ears, so you're young. And so our Earth is a young Earth. But then a less reputable journal wrote this. This, is, this new scientific result explains why ET won't return our calls. We're far too immature. We don't, you, you might know that, you probably know, that you do not talk to amoeba. <laughs> I don't know if any of you who tried, does anybody, is any microbiologist here in the audience? Any microbiologist? Have you tried to talk to amoebas? <laughs> no, you just manipulate them, push them around, right? <laughs> so, that's what, now if these other life forms on Earth, on the universe, in the galaxy, are on average two billion years more evolved, whatever that means, than us, then, hey, they don't want to talk to us. We know nothing. We're amoebas to them. That's the idea. I'm not sure how relevant that is, but maybe it is. Anyway, so let's talk about these galaxies again and the universe being a big place. So remember, there are 10 to the 11 stars in a typical galaxy, 10 to the 11 galaxies in our universe, and therefore the observable universe, and therefore there are this many stars. That's a big number. That's almost the number of molecules in this area here. A mold. Now, here's our galaxy. It's really not our galaxy, but it's about like our galaxy. It's about 100,000 light years across. Now, if you, you good technology people can make rocket ships, really smart rocket ships, 
They can go maybe, if they're really good, ion propulsion or something, use antimatter, they can go about one-tenth the speed of light. And so with a little math, you can figure out how long it will take us to send a rocket to the other side of the galaxy. It will take this long or a million years. Okay? A million years. Ten thousand of us. You know. anyway. uh, a million years. Now, how long has the galaxy been in existence? Well, the galaxy is 10 billion years old, 10 to the 10. So if you divide, how many times could a civilization that first started out uh, when the galaxy formed, how many times could it have sent a rocket ship traveling at one-tenth the speed of light back and forth and back and forth to colonize the entire galaxy? And well, it turns out that they could have sent a rocket ship 10 to the 4 times, 10,000 times, back and forth, back and forth. And yet, when we dig up our ancestors' bones, we don't find rocket ships from alien civilizations that have visited us. We find things like this. <laughs> so there has been no colonization of Earth as far as we know, despite what you read in some newspapers. <laughs> also, when people with radio telescopes listen, and there's a whole SETI program to search for extraterrestrial intelligence, the result so far is zero, nothing. So the silence. And this is known, the, the problem of, hey, if you had a, a technological civilization that could build a rocket ship like we can, you could have gone back and forth, you could have colonized the entire galaxy in probably, uh, well, very, very quickly. Maybe a thousand years or so, maybe 10,000 years. It doesn't matter, we have a lot of time to deal with. But we, can, we can't hear anything, and we can't dig up anything, and so what's the answer to that? Why is that so? And one answer is that human-like technological civilization that can build rocket ships are very rare or non-existent except for us. Another explanation is that uh, they're very common, but they die out very quickly. Another explanation is we're in the zoo and they're hiding themselves from us. It's a one-way glass. Right? They're hiding behind the moon and the planets and they're just looking around with uh, kaleidos not kaleidoscopes, but periscopes. Right? They're looking with periscopes so we can't see them. That's called the zoo hypothesis. But this is Fermi paradox, is where is everybody? There's been enough time to colonize the entire galaxy. Why haven't we seen? Why aren't we already members of the Galactic Federation? <laughs> and uh, so there are lots of stars, and we're saying hello. We're sending out signals all the time, but nothing has answered so far. <laughs> now, I want to make a segue to this, because this is an important fallacy that maybe most of you share. And how many have seen the Planet of the Apes movie? Okay, pretty high penetration. <laughs> okay, so Planet of the Apes is, the, is kind of like the following scenario. You have, uh, let's see, you have Charlton Peston. He's a scientist, or he pretends to be a scientist. And his space, he's in cryogenic preservation. His spacecraft goes high haywire, but he's going so fast that time doesn't go by or something. He doesn't know where he is. He crash lands with his crew on a planet. He doesn't know where in the heck he is. And then he gets his scientists with his meters and something, and they don't know where they are. On the other hand, if they have a watch, you can tell that the day on this planet is 24 hours exactly. <laughs> the composition of the atmosphere is exactly the Earth's composition. And there's corn. And there are Victorian era apes. They're chimpanzees. These are the smart ones. And then they have the, the militaristic gorillas. <laughs> and then you have the wise religious priests who are the orangutans. <laughs> the implication is, now this is an implication that's very easy, it sinks right in your head, and that is that if we make ourselves go extinct in World War III or four or five, we marginalize ourselves and become like rats in the sewer, then the next most thing, the thing that's most like us, will then become, inhabit this intelligence niche. That's the idea behind this movie. And the question is, how accurate is that? Is that just Hollywood crap? Or is that correspond in some way to reality? And like a lot of Hollywood crap, it enters into your emotional center and stays there and affects your thoughts. And I'd like to disinfect you a little bit. Here's another picture. You can see what kind of keys they used to have with wooden jails 200 years ago. And here's, here's the thing, now these scientists, although there was corn, and there were horses, and there were apes of three different kinds, he didn't know 
that he was on planet Earth until the last scene where he sees the half-buried Statue of Liberty. <laughs> so the guy's not a biologist. He says, damn it to hell, what have we done? He's banging on the door as he has some sexy woman here on a horse. <laughs> now, now, if you were a biologist, as soon as you land on the planet, or even a physicist, you're like, hey, 23, point, you know, 23 hours, 57 minutes, and 32 seconds is a diurnal. Look at that, that's exactly the Earth. This must be the Earth. He could have told that from the, from the very beginning. But it, no, his quarkometer said, oh, that is not quirky. Every, there are lots and lots and lots of planets with the exact same chemical composition in the DNA of corn and English-speaking apes. <laughs> But it was only when you find this art form that's kind of quirky that was the quirk that made the quirkometer, the penny drop, the eureka moment, I'm on Earth. So that's, so that's one of the stupid, I don't know, it's ridiculous. But anyway, what is behind that is a ridiculous assumption that I think many of us share, and it's our default. And that's a tragedy, I think. So let me try to say why. So the Planet of the Apes hypothesis is the following. Here we are humans. There's a niche called intelligence towards which all, or at least some species, evolve. Down here are apes, dogs, and sheep, and vertebrates with half a brain. And down here are bacteria, worms, fungi, and stupid things. <laughs> so when we marginalize ourselves in World War III or IV, then we're going to go down here, die, or go extinct. And then the apes will come up here and inhabit this intelligence niche. That is the idea, and a, a lot of good scientists believe in this idea. I think it's crazy because there's no evidence. I think there's evidence against this idea, and I'll present to you with some of it. It's not conclusive evidence, but I think it's highly suggestive, and I'd like to convince you of that. Here's a plot that was allowed to be printed in 1954, and I call this the Schwarzeneggerization of life. <laughs> You can see that life starts out here as a primordial cell, and then it says, hey, I want to be like Arnold Schwarzenegger, a tall, muscular... <laughs> a tall, muscular... Uh, divorcee, I guess. <laughs> a tall, muscular guy, and, and the major transitions of life are from going from here to here. And, you know, here's some plants. If you're a plant, you're just marginalized over here. Fungi are not even on this, right? <laughs> and, uh, so this is what we do. We put ourselves at the center, and we have to be careful of that. And that's a little bit what the Planet of the Apes hypothesis is. We're putting ourselves at the center, saying, we occupy this place, place. we're in control, we're the stewards of the Earth, and everything else is a bunch of crap, and they'd like to be us. And that's just not true. And, uh, but it's a perpetuate, it's a myth that's perpetuating. And here's, here's for example, this again, this is like a, a Greek brain here, without a body, and then he's involved. No, he, right? It's a he. Uh, you have some crystals here, then you turn into a fish, just primitive things here, and then the most advanced thing. And this is something in 1995. These are very good biologists still perpetuating this junk. And it's just crap. And it just makes me angry when I see it. I'd like you too to get angry and say the Planet of the Apes hypothesis is just stupid and wrong. Now, but let's ask, let's forget about the emotion. Is human-like intelligence a convergent feature of evolution? Is this type of brain that we have, something that other species would evolve towards if we weren't here? Another way to ask the same question, if we replay the tape of life, if we go back 500 million years, for example, 542 to the Cambrian explosion, and ask, if we did that, would we, homo sapiens or anything with a big brain, evolve again? And you can see Hollywood's answer is yes, definitely. Here's a guy from another planet, and he's obviously Got a big brain, right? Here's this emotional small brain thing. <laughs> so let's let's be specific. The Planet of the Apes hypothesis says there is a human-like intelligence niche. There is selection pressure on other species, including our ancestors, to occupy this niche. In our absence or on other planets, some species will evolve into that niche, and some of these species will develop technology. Carl Sagan has called the occupants of this niche the functional equivalent of homo sapiens, of humans. Now, I love Carl, like I said, but I just think he's dead wrong here. His argument is that there are many pathways to become a functionally equivalent humans, and I think there are not. And I want to show you the evidence from Earth why that is the case. Before I do, I call it the human-like intelligence niche. First of all, because I think all things with neurons have some type of intelligence than just not human-like intelligence. So I call it the human-like intelligence niche, not the intelligence niche, because we are the only species on Earth 
that has built radio telescopes and has the ability to be heard and to hear across interstellar distances. This ability that we humans have and that we are able to look for in others is a species-specific characteristic. This is important. To be able to look for in others, this makes it a science. This makes the search for this ability a science because that's what SETI is about. So Carl Sagan and Paul Davies, a collaborator of mine, say, yes, there is such a group of functionally equivalent humans. We are one of these groups. And these biologists, Ernst Meyer and George Gaylord Simpson, said, don't be ridiculous, you physicists. You just love your own brains. Humans, the closest relative of humans is here on Earth, not out in outer space, driving around in spaceships. So that's the biologists versus the physicists. Now, this is a biological question in many respects, and so I think you should trust the biologists. <laughs> so what is the evidence that such a group, this group here, functionally equivalent humans, what is the evidence that such a group contains Homo sapiens, but excludes all other terrestrial life? Right? We're drawing a circle around something called, these are functionally equivalent humans, we are part of it, intelligent human-like intelligent aliens are part of it, but giraffes and chimpanzees and fungi and nematode worms are not. Uh, so, here are there functionally and sexually equivalent humans who have evolved on other planets? Well, here's one, right? He's interested in Lois Lane, right? Clark Kent's interested in Lois. So he's involved on another planet. So his DNA is close enough to the DNA of a human, Lois Lane, for him to be interested in her. And probably if they have kids, I don't know if anybody's Superman fan here? Does Superman marry Lois Lane and have kids? Do you know that the advanced versions of Superman? <laughs> I don't know either. Anyway, but this guy is the result of a father who grew up on the planet Vulcan and a mother who's a terrestrial, and so we're just assuming that humanoids who are sexually competent, actually they're the same species because they can have, I think he can reproduce, he's not like a donkey. <laughs> <laughs> or a mule, what is it, a donkey or a mule? Mule, okay, he's not a mule, I don't think. Anyway, here's another example from this great movie, Avatar, and these guys are obviously hominoids, right? Look, they're just nine feet tall with a tail. Uh, and here's District 9. So these guys don't look that hominoid, but they're really just like Darth Vader hat and looks like an insect, but they have high, high technology, so they have human-like technology so they can make ships like that. Now, again, let's repeat the question. Is human-like intelligence a convergent feature of evolution? The biologists say no. The physicists in Hollywood say yes. <laughs> brought up as a physicist, but I didn't accept my dad as a biologist, so I would hate to get some out of Now, Frank Drake is a radio astronomer, and I was teaching this course, Are We Alone, as I said, and I was going to a meeting on the origin, there's a, there's a society called uh, ESOL, the International Society for the Study of the Origin of Life. And I was going to an ESOL meeting, and he was sitting next to the plane. We were flying from Mexico City to Oaxaca, where the meeting was, beautiful place. And I said, Frank, you know, I've been teaching this course, and I've been teaching the Drake equation, which is right here. I said, Frank, why do you think there are intelligent aliens who have built radio telescopes? And he said, and I said, what do you think is the strongest evidence? Because he's a scientist. I can ask him for evidence. That what is the strongest evidence that the human-like intelligence is a convergent feature? He said, read Harry Jars. <laughs> I said, okay, that's good. He's citing me somebody. So I read Harry Jars. Now, this is what Harry Jars said. Harry Jerison was a paleoneurologist who measured the brain cases of critters, of fossils. And he made a plot like this. Here's today, here's 50 million years ago, 100 million years ago, 200 million years ago. And then he invented something called the encephalization quotient, EQ, encephalization quotient, which is basically how big your brain is compared to your body. And then he did this plot. Here he has fish and reptiles are here, Virginia opossums rodents, birds, mammals, and then here we have homo sapiens. So you look at this plot and say, huh, look at that. There's a trend here towards higher brain things. And this was what Frank thought was the best evidence for uh, the idea that, that human-like intelligence, or high IQ, high EQ, is a convergent feature of biological evolution on Earth. And I looked at this, now I should say that I do data analysis for a living. And I looked at this and I said, that's absolutely crazy. 
absolutely crazy. Now, it's because it's got a, a very subtle selection effect that you need to be aware of. <coughs> the point is that this data is not evidence for a general trend towards increasing encephalization quotient. For example, consider the nasalization quotient. All right, you are an elephant. And you look around and say, you know, I have my hemoglobin looks like other mammals' hemoglobin. Uh, you know, I got ears are big, but you know, maybe not the biggest. The best thing about me is I have the highest nasalization quotient. If you take the length of my nose divided by the length of my body, I'm the biggest one. So if an elephant makes a nasalization quotient plot, he gets to put himself at the very top right. <laughs> So, so this is the relative nose size, the nasalization quotient. He's picked out a characteristic that he is the extreme example of, and then therefore put himself here and say, look at that, all of my ancestors have lower nasalization quotient, therefore there's a trend of biology on Earth towards higher nasalization quotients. That's ridiculous because you pulled out a, a point to the, this is what it's conditioned on, that point there. Therefore, you're going to have something like this. But if you picked out any of the other 2,000 traits that an elephant has, you will see things that go up and down and up and down. In other words, you will not put yourself up here. But anybody can do that. If you take a, I don't know, a mongoose, maybe they have quick reactions, have reaction time up here, and then put the mongoose here, and then here are the slower ancestors of the mongoose. That doesn't mean that there's a general trend towards increasing reaction time in the universe. It just means that you've identified your most extreme feature and put it there. That's a, that's a subtle selection effect. If you can appreciate that, use that, because often bad science is done when, when that, that's not appreciated. Yes. Yes. Assuming that evolution is universal. I don't know whatever you mean by that, but go ahead. Yes. It does help you survive? Well, that's the, that. Well, that's exactly the question. So let me show you some data on that. Let me skip ahead. Well, actually, how long did it take us to be intelligent? If you look back at the uh, record, it took about three, two or three million years for us, or our brains here, to go from this side to about that side. So that's how long it took on Earth for us to become human-like intelligence. So you can ask, well, why only us? What about other species? Now, there have been half a dozen long-duration experiments in vertebrate evolution have already tested the Planet of the Apes hypothesis. What do I mean by that? Well, if you're a landlocked creature and you can't swim more than a kilometer or two, then you are isolated to the continent where you were born. That means now, I come from Australia. You can tell from my accent, though, I'm American. So I'm American and Australian, by tribal. In any case, I, this is where I flew from two days ago. So I flew from here to Singapore, over here. And anyway, um, look at India here. India is, was free-floating for about 40 million years. Madagascar has been independent like this from Africa for about 90 million years. Australia and Antarctica have been independent of the rest of the world for about 120 million years. New Zealand even longer. So the question is, what happened on these independent experiments, and can we, we can use them as experiments to see what does evolution do? Don't they all become intelligent? Don't they do, aren't they, isn't the Planet of the Apes hypothesis correct? Well, let's, let's look. First of all, there's a schematic version of that. You start out with Pangea, so Pangea uh, divides in half about 180 million years ago. They've got one divides in half. Here for continent, here's India. India was independent for a while and then boom, bumped into, into Asia. And here's New Zealand over here on the right. So this time period here is how long each of these continents was independent. How long did it have? And you can see that two or three million years, well, South America was independent for a long period, about 100 million years. Australia and Antarctica were independent for about 110 million years, maybe 140, depending on whether you call that independence or not. Now, Madagascar, too. So we have these independent experiments that have already been run. And what have they shown? Well, first of all, this is uh, Jared Diamond. He's one of my heroes. He wrote Collapse, Guns, Germs, and Steel, The Third Chimpanzee, and Why Sex is Fun. He's being congratulated here for this latter book. But in New Zealand, what filled the intelligence niche? And he said, New Zealand is as close as we will get to the opportunity to study life on another planet. 
Well, New Zealand, what, what do you think is the closest thing to human-like intelligence? Is it a tuatara here or a kiwi? How about on the other, in Australia? When you look at the brain cases of Australia, of kangaroos, they have not been increasing over time. Koala's brain case has been shrinking. So these are possible candidates for human-like intelligence. But it seems obvious to me and most people that these guys are not on their way to building rocket ships and they're not trying to be humans. <laughs> they're much more like the common ancestors that we share with the lemurs about 100 million years ago or so. Or no, less than that, maybe 80. So here, now India was interesting. As a matter of fact, since this is in India, I wanted to do this. I wanted to show you this plate tectonics in a video because we earth scientists have made such things. Now watch this. This is today, and up actually this is third in the upper left there tells you how many million years ago it was. Thirty million years ago. So I can play the plectonic god here. Watch this. I go like this. So here's eighty million years ago, seventy million years ago, sixty million years. Here's India crashing into Asia. See that? And then you form the Himalaya Mountains twenty, thirty million years ago, and then then you're today. Okay. So this tells you how long each continents has been independent of the other continents, and you can judge by what uh, creatures are living there to the extent to which they have converged or evolved a human-like intelligence. And I think the answer is not. I think the plain answer is that they are not converging on human-like intelligence. So that, I think, is strongly suggested that this idea of, uh, of uh, this planet ape site is just crazy. It's just wrong. Here's in South America, for example. Here's a, well there they are, they're the candidates. Now, so the idea that humans, which cannot even evolve on another continent, could evolve on another planet is just crazy, despite what Hollywood has tried to convince us of. Now, we don't, now when I tell this to students, they don't like this because it, it upsets them, because it doesn't put humans at the center. And it says, now they say, we don't see, a, I, say, I know there's an objection to this. We don't see other occupants of the intelligent niche because we are the first and we have suppressed or killed the others. Right? We got here first and therefore we killed everything that's trying to become like us. Like just like we did two, two or three million years ago, or six hundred thousand years ago, to the Neanderthals possible. But the problem with that idea is humans weren't even on these other continents and islands until a thousand or fifty thousand years ago. So we could not have killed or suppressed these smart kangaroos that had 140 million years to get smarter. I mean, you think, there's a dumb kangaroo, he's a smart kangaroo, dumb kangaroo gets himself killed, smart kangaroo survives, propagates, smart, he has dumb offspring and smart offspring, smart offspring propagates more, etc., etc. That's the argument. It just doesn't work because it hasn't worked. Don't put it in your brain and say, oh, it will work. Look, be a scientist and look at what has happened on these independent experiments, and it hasn't happened. So, I, the, the conclusion is that humans are unique, just like every other species on Earth. It makes no sense to concoct an imaginary set of which we are the only terrestrial member, and then suppose that biological evolution elsewhere in the universe evolves towards this set. This concoction is the plan of the apes hypothesis. It's testable. It has been tested. <coughs> Paleoneurology does not support it for the reasons I showed. Half a dozen multi-million year experiments of vertebrate evolution are the best data we have to test it, not our imaginations about how good we are. They strongly suggest that there are no functionally equivalent humans in the universe, and this could explain the great silence that I talked about, that we have not been colonized by aliens. And yet, I support the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, because when we have the technology to cheaply explore new parameter space, we should do it. That's what science is all about. I think null results are important. And the universe may be stranger than we can imagine. And lastly, I may be wrong about the flat of the apes. <laughs> uh, so I've heard, when I've come to India, this is when I first visited India, and I've heard the word positivity and negativity talked about. And here's one way to, to understand our understanding. And that is, we have been dethroned, humiliated, and lost hope. As we found out, Copernicus told us that the Earth was not the center of the universe. And then Darwin said, oh, by the way, we're just an animal. And then Freud said, you don't even know what your brain is doing. 
And then there's this materialistic version of us that says, hey, you are just molecules. You're not making any choices. They're just electrons and molecules in your head do not make any choices. They're just going boom, boom, boom. <laughs> and then that's materialism. And then you have anonymity. Our star is just one of 10 to the 22 in the observable universe. So it's real. The more, this is what Steven Weinberg said at the end of his book, the first three minutes. The more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it also seems pointless. And then we have this new version of the multiverse in which our universe is part of an infinite multiverse where there are other universes. So that really is the ultimate in dethronement. So don't you feel humiliated and small? On the other hand, positively, this is progress towards an understanding. To find out that one is not the center of the universe is an important part of growing up. And if you, but to make sure that you don't get too positive, I wanted to show you this. signals from aliens, you really don't know what they are supposed to be. It's not going to be more scope, right? So, but you want to see something that is identifiably different from the natural noise that you know about at least a little bit. 
And so that's what you're trying to do. Natural noise, natural signals. That's what pulsars are all about, right? Pulsars are saying, little green men, right? They thought the, when, the, when they first found pulsars, they thought it was little green men, aliens. But then they said, wait a minute, we've got a magnetic field here. We've got a neutron star going around. Maybe that's the source of the signal. And so any way you can think of to identify, separate noise, signal from noise, that's what they use. They're not crazy. Sometimes, for example, using bandwidth can be very, very narrow bandwidth in frequency space or very, very broad. And uh, all kinds of techniques. You, you should join them up. Join up with them and try to figure out how to fine-tune their signals so they can be more accurate and detect those signals that are already out there that they're missing because they don't have the right uh, gadgets. Any other question here? Can Loudly, you, please. Can you, the wow signal and why was it so can you tell us about the wow signal and why was it so special? Uh, I don't know that much about the wow signal. I think it was in Ohio, detected by a guy, and he only saw it once. So it was a signal, and when you see a signal that's only detected once, no one else believes you. And so that's what happened. No one else believed that it was a signal, and so we're not very concerned about it because uh, it seems to have gone away. It hasn't, everybody, they've looked at the same star again and again, haven't seen it again, and so what can you do? Yes? So what do you think about the theory that life, life on the Earth is from the comets and the asteroids? Okay, what do you think of the theory that life on Earth is from the comets and the asteroids? Well, First of all, when you talk about life, you, you're made out of 65, 70% water. And you say, well, what about, where'd that water come from? And that's a debate that we're having. But we think the water on Earth came from a bombardment of things that were 10 to 20% water from the outer asteroid belt and with a small composition from the comets. This we think we know because the D to H, the deuterium to H ratio, kind of matches up. We have a new comet that we just detected. Previously, we thought the detection of D to H wasn't high enough in comets, but now we have one that matches up with our DH in our oceans. And so comets and outer asteroid belt is where our water comes from. But you didn't ask that, you asked, did life come from that? Well, I just showed you how amino acids probably rain down on any terrestrial planet, if particularly in the first half a billion years of its formation, that carbonaceous chondrite I showed you. There were 80 amino acids found in them. Your body contains about 20 amino acids. Of those 20, eight were among the 80 that were found. So in that sense, the composition, there's sugars, there's alcohol, there's a water, that's raining down on the Earth, and particularly, like I said, in the first half a billion years. And so if that's all you need for life, then life does come from them. 